right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. This is Sundial's breakout session where we're going to hear kind of a quick overview of kind of new capabilities in Sundials and then hear from various Sundials users. Uh, they're using Sundials and ECP uh, applications. I just want to note that this is a one hour session, so it's on the schedule for two hours, but that was just for scheduling convenience in Whova. So we'll be here for uh, one hour. Uh, to get things started off, Carol Woodward's going to give us an overview of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, recent and ongoing uh, work in Sundance. So Carol, take it away. All right, thanks. <clears throat> Just a quick check. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yep, looks good. All right. Um, and I, I want to, before we get started, I do want to thank Elsa Gonsurowski, who is our volunteer who's helping out today. Um, she is the host of the meeting. So if you're having any trouble, um, you can try to chat with her as well. Um, she also has been very helpful for Sundials uh, in helping to kind of push us towards getting some online documentation, which I'll mention briefly. But um, anyway, just wanted to thank Elsa and, and bring her to your attention in case you need some help. All right, uh, let's see. Um, before I get too far down the line, I wanted to uh, recognize our, our team. Um, so our Sundials development team, uh, the core team associated with ECP are uh, Cody Balos, uh, David Gardner, and Dan Reynolds and myself. And uh, we're all here uh, here in the room today and also um, you know, attending the ECP uh, annual meeting. Um, and then we also have Alan Heinmarsh, who still uh, works with Sundials. And then uh, Stephen Roberts is a new postdoc who joined us this, this past year. And then we have a long list of, of alumni, of people who have contributed to Sundials over the years. Um, and uh, most notably, I want to recognize Reddy Sherben, who was uh, instrumental in architecting Sundials uh, back at the start uh, to give us a lot of flexibility that we've been able to really capitalize on. Uh, so today's breakout is really to uh, kind of discuss some user cases of Sundials and um, help understand better how people are using the codes. Uh, <clears throat> and so to that end, I'll give a you know very brief here intro. And then uh, Lucas Escalopez will talk about the use of Sundials in Pele combustion. Uh, Steve DeWitt, uh, and Lucas is from NREL. Uh, Steve is from Oak Ridge, and he'll talk about Sundials in the MooMaps SS code, which is part of the EXA uh, AM for Added Manufacturing uh, project. And then Don Wilcox uh, from uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab will speak about uh, Sundials in AMREX, and he's been working on a time integration module in the AMREX Adaptive Mesh Refinement uh, framework. And so uh, that's been happening. Um, sort of building off of uh, bits and pieces of software that have been developing over through many hands over many years. And he's formalized and, and done some really nice things with interfacing with Sundials. So uh, just really quickly, Sundials is a software library uh, consisting of ODE and DAE integrators and nonlinear solvers. We have six packages, uh, CVODE, CVODE S, IDA, IDA S, R code and Kinsol. Uh, CVODE S and IDA S are sensitivity analysis variants. Uh, providing uh, forward and adjoint sensitivity. So now this is written in C with interfaces to Fortran. And I will say that Python interfaces are coming soon. Um, we're hoping this fiscal year that we'll have them released, but, uh, but they're coming soon. Um, there are some other Python interfaces to Sundials that have been out there. I, I'm not sure if anything is fully current with our, our releases. Um, and we're certainly uh, uh, taking a look at them as well. Um, Sundials codes have been designed to be incorporated into existing codes. So our goal is to really abstract out um, data dependencies and, and solver dependencies and such from the, the core integrators and the nonlinear solvers so that the codes can be pretty flexible in trying to, to adapt to different uh, user environments. Um, we do not try to be a framework that you build a full uh, application based on. Um, through ECP, we've been developing a very rich infrastructure of support on exascale systems and applications. You'll hear about you know, two or three of those today, or three of those today. Um, we are freely available, released under the BSD3 clause license, uh, had more than 100,000 downloads or clones in 2021. We have a very active user community supported by the Sundials users email list. And I, I got to say, we have some really, really helpful users on there who, uh, you know, even the the, the newbie users who come in and ask questions, um, you know, people are really respectful and very helpful. Um, so I, I you know, want to thank our user community there. Um, 
and new this year, so we've always had very detailed user manuals that have gone out with each package, but new this year, we have online documentation now at Read the Docs. And um, if you haven't checked that out, I do urge you to do so because uh, our, our user guides have gotten pretty big. Um, and this really gives a very nice searchable way of getting, getting to the material of most interest. Um, I think Cody uh, got those released and the very next day, all of us were, were talking with users using them. Um, so the, the kind of structure of Sundials looks like this, uh, where we've got the six packages and then they interface to generic uh, sets of interfaces to data structures, uh, matrices and solvers as needed. Um, so the key thing here is nonlinear and linear solvers and all data uses encapsulated from the integrators. And then all parallelism is encapsulated in the vector and solver modules. Um, and so that we're able to get a lot more flexibility there. So just quick outline of what's in Sundials in these packages. Uh, CVOTE and IDA uh, are ODE and DAE uh, integrator packages respectively. Um, they are based on linear multi-step methods. They're both adaptive in order as well as step size. And both packages include stiff BDF methods. And then CVOTE includes non-stiff methods. Generally, DAEs are much stiffer than ODEs. And so we don't really have a non-stiff integrator in the DAE package, but we do have it in the, the ODE package there. Our code uh, is the newest package in Sundials, and it was developed as an infrastructure for developing adaptive one-step multi-stage time integration methods. And the key there is to basically have that flexibility of one-step uh, but multi-stage integrators so that we can be more minimal to adaptive environments and also take advantage of a lot of the additive methods that have been coming online. So um, our code was originally designed to solve uh, a split system like this, uh, which may a system may or may not be split. Uh, it has fully implicit methods, fully explicit methods, and then um, uh, additive implicit explicit methods. Uh, the mass matrix may be the identity or any non-singular matrix that and optionally time dependent. Um, there are embedded methods for just about all of the methods that are shipped with R code, uh, which allows for adaptive time stepping uh, to meet accuracy criteria. We use a lot of the same heuristics here uh, as were developed in the CVOTE and IDA uh, packages. There are three steppers within R code uh, at the present moment. And uh, the first one is arc step, which, which has the, the traditional Runga cut method. So it has explicit, implicit, and additive IMEX methods. Uh, there's the ERC step stepper, uh, which is streamlined explicit Runga cut of methods, and the MRI step, which has multi ray infinitesimal step methods. And the MRI stepper basically uh, will evolve in time systems that have slow and fast components in the right hand side. If you imagine this right hand side split now, instead of into something that is stiff and non stiff, you have fast and slow, it will evolve the fast with a smaller time step size that involves the slow. And it does that in a way that keeps things consistent uh, to be able to provide higher order uh, uh, methods for that. We also have some wrappers for sundials uh, to be used with the x parallel and time uh, package. Uh, and that provides our uh, explicit, implicit, and IMAX methods from the arc step module uh, to be used under that parallel and time framework. Uh, and so x is available at, at Livermore. And then uh, we do have Kinsol, which is a nonlinear algebraic system solver package. Uh, it has Newton and accelerated fixed point methods in there, and it's meant for um, when you're not really worried about the time integration, but you still need to solve nonlinear system. And so that uh, Kinsol is used there. So our strategy for supporting use on GPUs, uh, which is first question most people in, in ECP ask, so I wanted to have a couple of slides on this. Um, this relies on users evaluating the problem defining functions on the GPU. Uh, we keep our logic on the CPU. We put the data on the GPU and leave it there. Uh, and applications perform function evaluations on the GPU um, and only scalers transfer to the CPU unless the user needs output uh, needs to output their data. Um, we supply native vector data structures with optimized methods for each of the programming environments um, with CUDA, HIP, and SICL. Uh, we supply interfaces to multiple linear solver packages with GPU-enabled solvers, and those um, options and what we're supplying interfaces to are growing uh, almost monthly these days. Um, we have flexibility for users to supply their own data structures, solvers, and memory managers underneath the Sundials integrators. Um, 
One specific use case that we're supporting is the, where Sundials is used as a local integrator for many independent subsystems. So reactive flow problems where chemistry systems are split from, from the flow, such as one sees in the Pele um, realm. Um, and uh, here we group the systems and integrate these groups as a larger system. Um, so here we now need to solve multiple groups simultaneously in different CPUs, CPU threads um, with GPU streams. And we use linear solvers designed for block diagonal um, linear systems uh, to take advantage of that. So, one here. Okay, um, our status in pre exascale environments uh, is given here. And um, I won't go into detail this. Uh, yeah, I won't go into a lot of detail here. Uh, the big thing is that um, we, we do have a lot of support now, as I've mentioned, for CUDA, HIP, and SICL based. Uh, structures and solvers. So what's new in Sundials? Um, higher order multi-rate methods that can integrate different portions of the problem of different time step sizes. So as I was mentioning, the MRI step uh, module within our code, and we keep fleshing out more and more methods there. Um, we also have new vector and solver support for SQL-based applications. Uh, support for logging more run diagnostic information. Um, so now we can get, uh, you know, full time step histories and, and solver iteration histories and things like that. Whereas before we only had aggregate information for that. Uh, we have a performance profiling layer with optional use of caliper. Uh, we've added the ability for CVODES to project the solution onto an invariant manifold as the solution has evolved. So this was developed um, for CVOD uh, a year or so ago, uh, and that's been extended into the sensitivity variant as well. As I mentioned, we have new online documentation and a new, like two weeks ago, we've moved our development repo fully to GitHub. So we've always had this GitHub page, but now our development repo is there as well. What are we working on currently? Uh, greater support on AMD and Intel GPUs. Um, so optimizations for our vectors, more batched solvers in particular. Uh, so interfaces to Ginkgo, Rockham, and MKL batch solvers. Uh, mentioned Python interfaces, more multi-rate methods and options, and greater interoperability to discretization packages. Uh, we do have some interoperability already with AMREX MF and MFIM. Um, we're developing more interoperability with the Chombo AMR package, and um, we interface to PETSI nonlinear solvers underneath our integrators, um, and PETSI is working on interfaces to Sundials. They have some old interfaces, but uh, they have said they're uh, going to be updating those soon. So uh, this is my last slide. So I'll just say, um, if you want to get more information about Sundials, uh, we have a website at the LLNL uh, domain. Uh, so you can check us out there. You can visit our GitHub page if you want to look at the code. Um, we do have tutorials on uh, our Sundials website under our publications page. And uh, so we have, uh, the thing to note is we have a basic use tutorial um, from 2019 and 2020. And then uh, a couple of days ago, we did a tutorial on some of our newest features. Uh, so that that tutorial will be up um, on that publications page within a few days. Um, we have online uh, user manuals, and you can download our tower balls from the Sun Sundials GitHub page, um, build them with CMake. And you can also install Sundials using SPAC. And I think. Uh, my last page is what I call my NASCAR slide, and I'll take any quick questions because I know we need to move on. Any quick questions for Carol before we switch speakers? Hey, Carol, if you want to stop sharing, yeah, we can get your slide set up for transition. Yeah, so we'll have so I think the Sundials team will be hanging around a bit after sort of the end of the session if you have any questions that come up in the meantime. Uh, so our next speaker will be Lucas uh, Lucas uh, Lucas Esquipes from uh, from from the National Energy Research Level Laboratory. We'll be talking about the Pele application and its use of sundials. Lucas, take it away. Ah, Lucas, you're muted. If you. <laughs> Sorry. Hold there it. you go. So well, thank you, and thank you, David, and thank you, Carol, for all the details that could show a lot of stuff coming in Sundials, and that's pretty exciting. So we're going to talk about how we use Sundials in Pele, and I'm uh, presenting on behalf of many people's uh, 
listed here are people from NRL, but also historically people from Sandia and LDNL worked on uh, Seaboat in Pele. So all of those people uh, helped us get, in, get, get there. So what uh, do the Pele, uh, uh, what Pele aim at is uh, simulating reacting Navy stocks on structured grid using uh, adaptive mesh refinement and evident boundary based on the AMREX library. And we have kind of two flavors of our uh, solver. One is called PLEC for compressible combustion simulations. And the other one is called PLELM for uh, low map combustion simulations. And both entails uh, generally different uh, time scales in terms of how far you want to integrate the chemistry during one of your uh, uh, overall time steps. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. Uh, and we also have uh, shared libraries that actually handles the chemistry for both code and all the uh, uh, multi-physics spray radiation for all code so that these modules are shared and not duplicated. On the right, you can see on the top an example of what we can do with uh, uh, PDLMX. So it's a, it's a spherically expanding flame uh, with uh, uh, H2 and air. And you can see that as the flame expand, it start uh, developing some uh, uh, diacylindrous uh, hydrodynamic instabilities. And on the bottom, when you have important uh, interaction between flame and shocks, you have uh, this case where you, we looked at the effect of the injection uh, uh, of the fuel, the location of the injection on what the, how the cavity of this flame holder uh, is behaving. So a little bit of our uh, two flavors. So compressible uh, is PLC. We use a uh, our own uh, external to set, uh, to send out stand, uh, time stepping, which is based on a predictor corrector uh, with a second order good enough uh, and it's uh, explicit diffusion. <coughs> and then because we are in a realm of compressible uh, code, we advance in time with an acoustic CFL. And so the step size is can be either of the order of what the chemistry uh, wants you to, uh, what detect, what the chemistry is dictating or could be uh, uh, larger. So we use both uh, our code and uh, the implicit CVO uh, integration from Sendiles. And on the other side is the LOMAC code. So we use a, a spectral default correction uh, stepping approach, again, with a second order good, good enough addiction scheme and uh, this time implicit diffusion. And this time our time steps is almost all the time way bigger than what the chemistry is dictating. So we're going to mostly use CBOD in that case, but that's still something we wanna uh, talk about and we, we, we can explore. So what, what do we do with, uh, with Sundials? Overall, uh, at the bottom, you have a schematic of what a simulation could look like. So for instance, you enter cold air plus fuel on one side, you have a thin reactive layer where you've put some, some of your AMR patches around it, and then you end up with uh, odd combustion products uh, going out of the domain. And so you can see you have uh, a large disparity is because when you have cold air and fuel, it's pretty easy to solve. The system is not that stiff. If you have pure uh, hot combustion products that are near equilibrium, it might not be that stiff either. But within this thin reactive layer, you have a lot of things happening. And that's where uh, we really uh, have to leverage what Sunday else uh, offers. So what do we do? Uh, we start by doing, in both code, we do the advection and the diffusion before going into Sunday else. And uh, the chemistry integration itself solve for both uh, the uh, 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 chemistry term, so the W uh, omega dot here. And we have a, a, a piecewise constant representation of what the advection and the diffusion uh, is doing. And so you evolve your vector of uh, uh, unknown, which is, for instance, the species max fraction plus a representation of the energy, let's say temperature. Uh, and so that's our system. And because of what I've just said, we need a relatively, a relatively flexible integration method because we can have large disparities in terms of uh, stiffness. Uh, we can have, depending on the usage, uh, chemical system ranging from 10 to maybe 100, 150 species. So we have quite a large range of uh, system too. And so we're going to be using uh, all CIVO, both CIVO and R code from Sunnails. And also we had a uh, uh, in-house uh, ring Akuta 6.4 method uh, that we can still use in some case. So what generally we, we do is on TPU, we were doing these uh, each cell uh, sequentially, or uh, at least on each uh, MPI rank. 
And the main idea when we switch to GPUs is to solve uh, each cell into an MR box all at once. Uh, and so you have now, so basically representing this schematically, you have on cell one, you have your chemical system and we are going through these sequentially on CPU and on GPU, we wanna pack them up when they come from our uh, AMREX uh, box and solve them uh, all at once. And so uh, the main strategy we've, we've used and I'm, I'm gonna focus on CBOD, CBOD there is uh, we're gonna either use uh, uh, Sundial's uh, GF and key uh, based on GMRS to do this uh, linear solve within the, the BDF method uh, used in TiVo. And so the, this has to solve so the entire system and cell times the number, the size of your system. And we're not gonna have to form the matrix, which is pretty good. And so you don't have to uh, supply a, a Jacobian function. It has a minimal memory overhead and it's uh, readily available on all platform because as, as uh, Carol mentioned, they have support for uh, any vectors on both CUDA, HIP, and uh, SQL. So that's one of the options, and that's one that, is, that we actually try on, on many systems. And the other option is we use, uh, we rely a lot on uh, the batch block solve, where we try to leverage the fixed pattern of your chemical system that is present in each of the cells. And so you're gonna uh, try to uh, do, for instance, a symbolic factorization on only one and then reuse this factorization on all the, the system. And that's <clears throat> what the, the batch implementation of, uh, of the, this uh, dense or sparse linear solves have been doing in the back end. And so we are either using the QSparse uh, interface that Sundials developed uh, when we are on NVIDIA hardware, and then we switch to <clears throat> the Magma uh, interface that uh, uh, Sundials added when we are on CUDA or HIP uh, for NVIDIA and NV uh, hardware respectively. And so doing this is, uh, as we'll see, is uh, improving our performances, but it requires forming and solving the linear system, we can, which can have a significant memory of the head, especially if we start having large batch size, so large boxes. So one uh, note there is we see that our system entries uh, can span a fairly wide range of scales because we have, uh, let's say energy or temperature, which could be to like 10 to the power four. And then we have very small uh, trace species that could be uh, 10 to the power, power minus 10. So uh, providing absolute tolerances for each entries uh, when we uh, solve uh, for CVOD has been uh, shown to improve uh, the, the performance of CVOD, especially when using GMRS. And that's a, a graph actually extracted from uh, a David analysis recently. And uh, when you do look at the two central uh, plot, you can see that by switching from a fixed absolute tolerance to a per component absolute tolerance, we, we reduce the number of uh, nonlinear uh, uh, sub-step and then nonlinear iteration and then right-hand side uh, call. So that's something uh, that we use and uh, that we recognize in, in our application. So just get a few figures. So going from uh, CPU to GPUs uh, on a simple, relatively simple test case that we use to do our scaling studies. So on the on the left is what, is, what Pele LMX is doing in terms of splitting between the different pieces of the, of the code. And you can see that uh, on the right, so the, the OM, the, regular MPI plus OMP, uh, chemistry is one of our biggest uh, spending uh, uh, piece. And when we switch to uh, uh, MPI plus CUDA, we actually got a, a huge speed up uh, on, the, on the chemistry itself. And that's uh, in part responsible uh, due to this batch uh, solve because we're not, now, not launching now CVOD multiple times one after another, but we're really, uh, uh, solving and have and packing data so that we have a uh, compute intensive kernel uh, used within uh, uh, CVOD. And so that's, that's a huge uh, acceleration uh, for uh, just jumping into, into GPUs. Uh, <clears throat> then we, on GPUs, we started looking at the effect of the system size. So the number of species, uh, for instance, in your chemical mechanisms and then the batch size. So how many cells is there in a box? And, do you need to split box before going into uh, uh, Sundials and this kind of problem? So we tried three system size. 
ranging from 21 species to 88 species, which is rather typical. And now we, we're actually moving even to bigger mechanism. And the plot on the right shows uh, GM rest in blue, Q sparse uh, in green, and magma in red for the three mechanisms. And uh, each column is a different batch size. So you can see that uh, for almost all the cases, magma is actually faster. Uh, only when you start going into bigger uh, batch size, uh, we see that uh, magma start uh, having uh, beginning uh, to, to get slower than, uh, than say, GM rides, which has a pretty fixed uh, kind of price uh, uh, expense here. So we have actually been switching to using magma most of the time when we can, when we have a, a Jacobian function available. Uh, and Hopefully, uh, as uh, Carol mentioned, uh, other uh, interface to batch solver are coming online from the sender teams, uh, and we'll be definitely exploring those uh, in the future. So let's let's also look a little bit at weak scaling uh, and strong scaling of our uh, application. So Pele C on the left and Pele LM on the right. Uh, you can see that <clears throat> going from uh, one to uh, one node to uh, all of summit, uh, we have a loss of about 50% of parallel efficiency on our weak scaling plot. And um, most of it doesn't actually come from the chemistry, but it's coming from linear solvers, uh, especially in the case of uh, PLLM, because we have uh, implicit diffusion solve and Mach projection that needs to communicate a lot. And so that's where these uh, uh, drops come from. And now, if you look on strong scaling, so again, because we are uh, doing linear solve that is not uh, something we expect to perform very well. And you can see on the left PDC again, on the right PDLMX, or PDLM, sorry. And <clears throat> you can see uh, on the right plot that if we look at the chemistry itself, uh, we are not too far from, uh, from pretty close to a, a IDL scaling, which uh, a little bit below that. And so that's a, a good indication that uh, chemistry is really not our bottleneck like when we start to pack uh, to to uh, strong scale our, our product, and that's a, a good, very good news. So a little bit <clears throat> of what we're going to try uh, to do in the future. So as Carol mentioned, uh, at one point we we explored using uh, multiple C1 instances uh, going through a different OMP thread. So enabling having a concurrent uh, MRX box into different uh, GPU streams. Uh, so C Cody worked on that actually a good year ago. But most of the time we're operating near the GPU memory limits. And so that's not a viable option because you, you have an, a memory overhead of having both uh, or more than one C mode acting uh, concurrently. But as, as we just saw, when we go to uh, strong scaling, uh, we have more room in memory, and hopefully we can we could actually leverage that to uh, improve our uh, further improve our strong scaling performance of the chemistry and and of the overall application. And we also recently switched to a from a compile time to a runtime chemistry integrator selection. So before we were compiling only the R code or only the C code interface, and now we're compiling everything, and we're able to switch uh, at runtime between the two. And so. That opens up possibilities to uh, optimize the choice of the integrator or the parameter of the integrator locally uh, based on some characteristics of the box. And that's something we haven't explored much, but uh, that hopefully we'll uh, explore soon. And that could provide some uh, further improvement in the chemistry uh, performances. But that's pretty much all. And if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. Or David, if you want to keep the question for the end. Uh, no, you've uh, you've got about a minute or two left on your time. So so so, if there are any quick questions for for Lucas, we'd be happy to take them now. I guess one quick question is: Could you remind me of the difference between Pele LM and Pele LMX, and kind of why there why there are I guess two versions of that? Yeah. So PLM was developed uh, over the course of the last four years, and it's uh, subcycling sub with subcycling AMR uh, AMRX, AMR approach. So each the coarsest level is gonna evolve in time at larger time steps, and the next finer uh, level is gonna halve the time step to keep the CFL constant, and so on and so on. And you have a recursive 
uh, kind of time stepping method. And for reason uh, related to uh, maintaining uh, our uh, pressure on the on the constraint decided uh, dictated by Lomac with within a context where the pressure is evolving in time, we actually switch to a non subcycling version where all the, the levels are advancing at the same time. And so that's what PLMX is. So that kind of is also a slight difference in that we no longer integrate over like extremely large uh, DT uh, in the case of LMX. Mm. All right. Well, thank you, Lucas. I think we'll switch speakers now. Um, yes. yep. Our next speaker is going to be Steve uh, DeWitt from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's going to be talking about the new maps uh, phase field code from the X to AM project. Uh, Steve, take it away. Hi, everybody. Can you see my screen? All looks good. Fantastic. Um, so as David said, my name is Steve DeWitt, uh, and I'm from Oak Ridge. And so I've been working on a code called a MEMAP C++ uh, with uh, Red Hat Christian Bella Submaranian. Um, and so this work with Sundials, uh, I've done in conjunction with uh, with David and Carol. Um, and there's no way I would have been able uh, to do any of this without their help. Um, let's see. So uh, first, to give a little bit of background about MEMAP C++. Um, so it's a face field framework in XAM for solid solid phase transformation. So XAM is an AD project for uh, additive manufacturing simulations. And, and MUMAPS is, is one of about eight different uh, codes that, uh, that XAM is, is developing. Um, and so, so here we're using a MUMAPS uh, to simulate the precipitation of, of gamma prime, gamma double prime, and or delta phases and nickel based super alloys. And so these phases can, can, can form either during the additive manufacturing build or, um, or during a post build heat treatment. Um, and essentially these, these different uh, phases can, can dramatically affect the, the, the strength of the, the material, um, particularly at high temperatures. And so the, the component lead for this is, um, is, is RAD. Um, and, and this effort here is a uh, C++ rewrite of the MEMAPS SS Fortran code um, that was developed uh, before ECP um, and then continued development um, through ECP. And then um, as part of XAM, uh, we started this, this C++ rewrite. Um, and so, so MUMAPS plus plus, as well as MUMAPS SS, use a pseudo spectrum method with a semi implicit time integration. Um, and so, before I, I jump into the full uh, uh, MUMAPS model, I want to start with just a very simple phase field model. And so, so this is the, the Con Hilliard equation um, that, that you see here up at the top with this, this double well um, uh, uh, chemical potential uh, given on the, the second line. And uh, so what this does is this models uh, the process of, of phase separation and, and coarsening in a material. So it's relevant for, uh, for metals as well as polymer systems and, and some other cases as well. So if you start off with some kind of uh, random noise and then you let it go, you get a phase separation. So the, the, the C variable goes to, to zero in, in one phase, one in another phase. And then you get evolution such that a, a free energy functional is minimized. And so I, I, a common uh, temporal discretization um, for the system is, is this uh, semi-implicit uh, discretization where you have a explicit nonlinear term um, with that, that derivative of the, of the chemical potential or the chemical free energy, as well as a implicit uh, linear term, uh, because that's what uh, controls your, your, expli your, your, your explicit time step size. And so if, if you make that implicit, you can, make, uh, you can take larger time steps. Um, and so, uh, as I said before, since this is a pseudo spectral method, if we move this to, to, to Fourier space, um, you can see that those derivatives turn into um, multiplications by, by wave vectors, but you still get this, this same general form where you have a, a explicit nonlinear term plus a, a implicit uh, linear term. Uh, and then here, the, the, the tildes uh, represent that these are now the, the, the Fourier space um, transforms of, of the, the compositions. Um, so then you can rearrange this um, so that you have a, a semi-implicit update for um, C with no linear solve. And so that's, that's kind of the, the main motivation for this kind of discretization is that since that, that, uh, that implicit term is, is linear, um, you don't have to have any sort of a, a um, the, the, the FFTs take care of the, the linear solve. And because it's, uh, because it's linear, you don't have, a, have, to, have to deal with a, a non-linear solve. 
Um, and so uh, about, I think maybe a year and a half ago, um, I wanted to explore moving this to, to sundials. And, and the idea was to, to retain a, a semi-important implicit formulation um, that's free of a, of a nonlinear or, or linear solve. Kind of maintain this the same general structure. And so the idea is to use R code with, with a trivial linear solve. Um, and from Sundial's perspective, everything is in is in Fourier space. Um, so it so Sundial doesn't kind of know anything about the real space re representation of the PD. Um, and so it looks like this, which is much like what we saw on the other term on the other page. So we have this this explicit nonlinear term, which is the first term, and then we have an implicit linear term, which is the second term. Um, and so that first term is expensive because we have to do FTEs or, or FFTs um, as a part of the the right hand side calculation. Um, but the implicit term is is cheap because you can you can calculate um, those those k vectors. Um, kind of, you can you can calculate that that operator ahead of time, um, and so you don't have to do any FFTs uh, for that part of the the, the right hand side. And then of course because of this, the this is the uh, uh, ECP, I want to talk a little bit about our GPU implementation. So MeMaps C++ is, is built on Hefty, which is a um, FFT library that's part of the, the ECP, um, as well as Cocos for our, our performance portability layer. Um, now that introduces a problem because uh, Sundials doesn't have native support for Cocos views. Um, and so what I ended up doing was um, I create the appropriate end vector using a pointer to the view data outside the, the time stepping loop. Um, and then inside my, my right hand side functions, then I wrap the end vector data pointer into a Cocos unmanaged view. Um, so that kind of for the purpose of, of my, my Cocos kernels, it just looks like a, a standard Cocos view. Uh, and then I use preprocessor directives to match the end vector types to the Cocos backend. And so if I'm um, on an AMD machine, um, I'll use the, the, the hip end vector as well as the, the, uh, the hip Cocos uh, backend. If I'm on a uh, NVIDIA machine, I'd, I'd use the, 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 the two uh, uh, CUDA backends. And so the result for this is I can use the uh, Cocos kernels inside the Sundials functions. And in fact, uh, I didn't have to change the Cocos kernels at all, other than I had to kind of split things up a little bit to get the, the implicit and the explicit sides into different parts. But other than that, the Cocos kernels look um, exactly the same. Um, and I just had to kind of add these, um, these wrapping steps to, to translate between the, the end vectors and, and the Cocos views. But essentially the code looks uh, mostly like the, the manual first order code. And so the upshot was that after taking a bit of time to kind of split up the code into these, these different right-hand side functions, um, I was able to go from the code working on the host uh, to, to working on the, the CUDA and the, and the HIT backends uh, with a few hours of work, which I think really is a testament to the, the flexibility of the, of the Sunhouse framework. Um, and so uh, first I want to present a, a performance comparison using um, this, this kind of simplified Tom Hilliard problem. Um, so here uh, I'm using a 3D version of that, that spinal decomposition uh, problem that I showed over on the first slide. So this is performed on, on one summit node using six GPUs. And so here I'm comparing kind of non-sundials manual time stepping that's first order accurate with a fixed step to sundials with third, fourth, and fifth order accuracy and an adaptive step. And so here I'm using a reference solution with a very low error tolerance uh, so that I can calculate that the error for each simulation. And so here you can see the, uh, the results of this uh, performance test. And so the, the, the manual non-sundials timing are, is given by these, these black squares. And so on this, this plot, you want to be towards the origin. So you want to be low error, low wall time. Um, and so you can see here that uh, for these kind of various uh, types of, of sundials um, uh, simulations, that they're for a given level of error, they have dramatically less wall time. Uh, and here I've, I've uh, highlighted this, this uh, boxed region here. It's kind of the application relevant error range. And so, so as you'd expect with any higher, higher order method, as you go to arbitrarily low errors, um, it's going to win out. Um, but for our application, we don't necessarily care about what's happening in the, the 12th digit. Um, we kind of care about where these interfaces are at the end of the, 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 the simulation. And so that gives you kind of errors within this, this box. And so depending on whether you, you compare the the, the, the wall time um, here at kind of the, 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 the high end of the error, at the low end of the error, um, we're, we're getting about uh, 10 to 20 times faster uh, with sundials that, than the manual time integration, which I think is really, um, really phenomenal. Um, and, and here, so the, the sundials, um, the sundials results here are, are for third order are given in blue, fourth order in red, and then uh, the fifth order in, um, in magenta here. And 
Uh, for the most part, uh, third order seems to be sufficient. Uh, maybe fourth order, um, I, fourth order also seems to, to work well, but, but fifth order is, is clearly overkill. And essentially, if I try to go to the lower errors uh, with fifth order, it, it, the, the simulation goes, goes unstable. Um, and so here, these are shown with, with adaptive time stepping. Um, but for this particular test, um, it seems like most of the impact is from the higher order, not from the adaptivity. If I ran these, these simulations for longer, the driving forces decrease, um, and the adaptivity would probably have a, a, a larger impact. And then we'd see even larger uh, performance boosts uh, versus the, the, the first order fixed time steps. And then I also want to say here that the, the direct sundials overhead is minimal. When I profile this, um, essentially, you don't see any of the, the sundials calls at all. It's uh, exactly the same as with the manual code, where most of the time is spent on, on one of the, in one of the, the Cocos loops, um, as well as with the FFTs. Um, so with this, uh, with these promising results, I want to move to the, the full MuMaps um, SS application, uh, which is a bit more complicated. So here we have um, some arbitrary P number of phase field um, equations, the, the top equation there. We have some arbitrary N number of diffusion equations based on the number of, of uh, components for a system, um, as well as we're enforcing uh, mechanical equilibrium um, at every time step. Uh, but we want to take kind of more or less the same approach that we did for the, the Con Hilliard, uh, which means we split each of the evolution equations into nonlinear explicit and linear implicit terms. And then we're weakly coupling between the, the, the equations. So we're using the, the, the previous time step value for kind of the other fields. So when we're solving the, the update for C naught, for the other, or, or for X naught, for the other um, X fields, as well as all the five fields, we're using lagged values. Uh, for the elasticity calculation, Sundials doesn't really know about it. So it's, it's inside the, the nonlinear. Um, explicit right-hand side evaluation. Um, so there we're using the, the previous time step values for the, the X and Phi fields, and we're only calculating once per time step. Um, and so in order to do that, I had to hack together a, a stage counter. Um, and uh, as kind of a teaser, I, I, I don't know that that's working correctly. Um, and so here I want to show the same kind of performance comparison that I did for the Count Hilliard case. So this is kind of a simple uh, four precipitate test problem. So here we have four different phases, so a background matrix and three precipitate phases um, uh, for a ternary system. So there's there's three different elements. Once again, it's performed on, on one summit node using six GPUs. And we're comparing the manual first order method um, with, a, with a fixed step to a third order with an adaptive step. Uh, once again, using a reference solution with a, with a low error tolerance. Um, but here, um, unlike before, the, the manual time stepping is, is always doing better than, than the sundials time stepping. And so you can see that that for any for any error level that it has a has a lower um, wall time. So the higher order doesn't even help at very low errors, which is surprising. Um, and then here I've, I've done both fixed and adaptive time steps, um, and and kind of those uh, seem to uh, seem to work kind of similarly. Um, so what's going on here? So um, it turns out that for fixed time steps, I'm not getting the the third order convergence that I'd expect. It's closer to, uh, to, to first or, or, or second order. Um, and so I think there's a few different reasons uh, that this could be happening. It could be due to some of these implementation shortcuts, whether it's the, the weak coupling or the way we're handling the, the elasticity solve. Um, but I think there's, there's some chance that there's a bug in the stage counter. And so I think um, at least with some, some tests that I was doing uh, yesterday, it seems like perhaps it's, it's skipping one of the elasticity solves um, in, in the first time step. Um, but if it, if it turns out that it's not one of these implementation issues, it could be uh, some details in the, in the specific test case that maybe it's not as amenable to these high order schemes. Um, but really the next steps are to, to try first order time stepping using a custom virtual table. And so um, I got that working yesterday and so I have to do some, some rigorous uh, tests there. Uh, and then also just to turn off the elasticity to see if that's, um, that's an issue either in a bug in the stage counter um, or, or kind of some uh, approach to that, that lag solve there um, is, is dropping my, my uh, uh, the order of accuracy there. Um, and so I, just to, to quickly wrap up, um, so I added support for Sundial's time integration um, in MeMap C++. Um, I was able to uh, get a interface between uh, Sundial's and Cocos through wrap data pointers and pre-compiler pre uh, directives. Um, and so I have uh, MeMap C++ with Sundial's working on, on the host on NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. Uh, for a simple test problem, I was able to show at least an order of magnitude uh, performance improvement, um, but that hasn't translated to the full problem of interest. Um, 
but because we're getting the worst than expected convergence, um, I think there's a good chance there's an implementation issue. Um, so I did take kind of a, a bit of work to, to refactor the code with sundials. Um, but once I, I did that, it's it's been really flexible. And so I've been able to, to add things like the, the CUDA and HIT backends in the small amount of time. I was able to, to play around with the, the multi-rate uh, time integration um, in a short amount of time. Um, and then also just generally, if you haven't worked with the Sundials team, um, they're an absolute delight to work with. Um, so I recommend Sundials both as, as a as a as a code as well as uh, working with the team has just been great. And so this this work um, has been funded, of course, through the ECB. And uh, I think I'm over time, but I'd be happy to take any questions at the end. Let's see if you're right on time. So actually, you're right at the, the 15 minutes. So uh, okay. I guess any quick questions for Steve, maybe as we uh, transition over uh, to Don. So maybe Steve, you'll stop sharing. Don, you'll get started. And I see one hand raised. Uh, Dan, you want to go ahead? Right. So uh, it would be interesting to see how we how to assess this, but I, I'm guessing it's the 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 kind of lagging that you use in in, in that coupled solve that's causing a first order uh, issue. I would, I mean, for flexibility of your solve, it would be nice if that weren't the case. But but you know, technically, anytime you just pick some term to lag, you're going to go to first order uh, theoretically. Uh, so it would be nice if we could assess whether that's really the case. Uh, I don't know how hard it would be to try to do it in a in a coupled manner, even though the solve would probably be pretty nasty, but at least it could help identify the, the, the convergence question, right? Yes, okay, that, that's good to know. Yeah, I, wonder, I wondered if that lag solve would, uh, yeah, would, would, would result in that. Uh, Carol, really quick, if you wanna ask your question, and Don, you can get your uh, slides shared. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, and, and this was part of the motivation for suggesting running a first order was to do that first order verification um, and just verify that the codes, with the first order with Sundials was performing similar to what your manual first order was doing, uh, solution correctness wise, right? Um, and then that gives us a starting point to to go forward. Yeah, and the the yeah. first order. First order of sundials does give a slightly different answer than the manual first order. And it looks like it does the zeroth time step uh, linear elasticity solve. It skips it, it, it skips it for the for the first one, and then it does it every one after that. So I think there could be something wrong in that that kind of hack together stage counter. Okay. So um, yeah, so so I, I think we talk next week or or sometime. Yeah. So we'll we'll chat some more. Um, but this is really cool. I, I, you know, thanks for your talk. Um, it's, it's always, uh, and I think, you know, the, the other application folks will attest to this, you know, when you translate to a full on application, there's always uh, little things that come out that uh, folks weren't thinking about, right? Um, little assumptions that were made in the development of the application that, that can, you know, rear their head when you change a method, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I uh, yeah let's let's keep let's keep talking. I think this is really cool though. Thanks for for putting this together. Thanks. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, Carol and Dan, for the uh, for the uh, questions. Uh, our last speaker is going to be Don Wilcox uh, from Berkeley Lab. He's going to be talking about some interfaces between AMRX and Sundials that he's been uh, setting up. So Don, I'm going to take it away. I can see your slides, but I cannot hear you yet. So you muted and unmuted Don, but still not getting your audio. I can see you, but I cannot hear you. <laughs> let me just, let me just. Oh, there you go. There it is now. You can hear me now? Okay. Yes, loud and clear. Let me, so the last time I tried enabling my microphone after I screen shared, let me switch that order now. <laughs> Um, all right, can you hear me and see my screen? 
Yeah, I can hear you. And yep, yeah, slides just came up. Great. Um, all right. And you can still see the slides, right? <laughs> yep, looks see. good. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks so much um, for inviting me to, to give this talk in this session. Um, I want to highlight some, some new time integration features that um, we as a part of the AMREX development team have, have implemented um, in, in collaboration with the, um, with the Sundials team, uh, particularly David Gardner. And, um, and so with that in mind, I, I'm Don Wilcox. I'm part of the Center for Computational Sciences and Engineering at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And, um, and over the past few months, I've worked closely with Ann Almgren and, uh, and Jean Sexton, also from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, as well as David Garner from Lawrence Livermore. And, um, and we've been focusing on, uh, on more tightly coupling um, Sundial's capabilities with classes that AMREX can provide users that, that will make using uh, time integration features that Sundial's provides more easy, uh, easier. So with that in mind, um, I want to point out that um, now these are new point, these are not new points for, for those of you who have listened to the other great talks just before, but I want to point out that one of the reasons that people use AMREX and Sundial's packages is because they offer new user codes, both features and sustainability. Um, and for those of us in the scientific software engineering field, we have two main concerns usually when designing a completely new code for users. One is we need the, the latest applied math and software features. Um, so if, you, if you're solving PDEs, for example, you want usually some form of adaptive mesh refinement because you know, most challenging problems, you, 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 want to you want to calculate some large scale flow or, or um, some very macroscopic process. And you also want to be able to, to capture very fine details of that process, which could be very highly nonlinear um, and could affect the, the details of the macroscopic system uh, like in flames. Um, so you want adaptive mesh refinement. Um, that's why you might want to use AMRX. Um, you might also want distributed domain parallelization. This is commonly done over MPI and I'll explain you know, how we do this in AMRX for, for those of you who might be new to it uh, in a bit. You also might want fine-grained parallelism. So you want to be able to loop over individual cells in your domain. Um, and ideally you want to be able to, to implement those loops in, in a way that can take advantage of the latest hardware accelerator features like GPUs. You probably also want discretization for various types of PDEs. You want various spatial stencils for your PDE operators. And you want to be able to, to take advantage of different kinds of data centering. So you might have um, cell-centered data, face-centered data, uh, as, in, as in fluxes, or you might even have edge or node-centered data. Um, for, for things like um, magnetohydrodynamic solvers or, um, or electromagnetic solvers. And so, um, and so, and so you, you want all of these features, but in addition, you want some flexibility for your time integration scheme. You wanna be able to take advantage of explicit solvers, implicit solvers, or multi-rate solvers. Ideally, you would be able to combine all of these features into one code, but that's very difficult and it makes it hard to sustain your, your solver um, because you need to maintain such a diverse software stack and, you, and accommodate a user base that usually really just cares about what is the answer to my science question and not um, how do I keep all of these code packages and features playing together nicely. Um, and at the same time, keeping up with latest trends like GPUs and, and modern libraries. So we offer interfaces between AMRX and Sundials to, to solve some of these concerns. And I'm gonna show how this works in a bit. Um, for those new to AMRX, why would you use it? Well, it enables some large scale and fine grained data parallelism for a PDE solver you might want to design. On the left, we see an example of block structured grids on three different levels in, in different colors here. Black is our um, is our course domain. Um, in blue, we see two different grids 
that refine our coarse domain by a factor of two. Um, and then in red, we see two uh, additional domains that, def that refine our blue grids by another factor of two. Um, one of the things that, that you'll see in this geometry is that AMREX provides block structured refinement where your blocks can overlap block intersections at coarser levels. And, and what we do is, is work with our fundamental unit of um, uh, our data structure is called a multifab, which, which stores data on one of these levels. So you can think of a multifab storing data at one of these colors. And then that multifab has a collection of grids inside it, which you see as, uh, as one of these colored boxes. And our fundamental sort of approach in the AMREX code is to provide ways of, uh, is to provide functions that enable communication and parallelism using these data structures that let you easily loop over your data. Um, and so this is an example of your AMR hierarchy. On each level, you might have multiple grids, like I mentioned, and you've got some fine uh, grain parallelization that's shown on the right. We allow you to, to, to just set up, we allow you to, to separate each of these grids into a set of tiles if you're using OpenMP, um, or if you're using something like uh, CUDA, then you want to parallelize a GPU kernel over each one of these cells in your grid. And, um, and so a typical sort of software um, flow is to, is on each, is you loop over levels, and then at each level you loop over your local grids, and you're going to need to fill some ghost cells for your grids, that is cells that are, um, that are spaced around each grid's interior that represent data on adjacent grids. So we provide functions that let you easily fill those, um, and you don't have to worry about the MPI, MPI communication yourself. Um, and then we also provide functions that, that do GPU kernel launches to work with your data within each grid. Um, so, so those are that, that's that's those are some examples. You know why you might want to use AMREX. We provide all these cool features for parallelism and your data layout. You never have to write any MPI code yourself. You never have to write any CUDA code yourself. You can stick with C plus plus and get all these features for for free essentially. Um, now, you've you probably heard lots about sundials earlier in this in this session. I'm not going to repeat all of that, but by this point, you should know sundials offers lots of cool features that you might want to take advantage of instead of writing your own time integrator. Well, what if you want to put those together? Um, and so I'm going to outline the steps here for using our new interfaces to write a new AMREX plus sundials code. Um, and there are basically three steps here that I'm going to walk us through. The first is to set up your PD spatial discretization scheme with AMREX. Um, essentially, this this requires you to define a right-hand side function for your time integration. Um, and um, you're, first, we're going to arrange our data layout using AMREX multi multifab data structures, then write loops over our local grids to fill the right-hand side, and finally use AMREX C++ lambdas to run on GPUs for fine-grained parallelism. Our next step is to connect our right-hand side function to sundials using the AMREX time integrator class. It's a new feature that supports native Runcocutta based integrators, as well as Sundials integrator backends using R code, including the ERK and MRI step backends in, in Sundials. And then in your inputs file at runtime, you select the time integration backend um, that you want to actually use. And um, so, so your code itself is agnostic to exactly what time integration method you're going to use. And you can, you can set that up in your inputs file at runtime, which lets you easily try different integration schemes out with your PDE solver. And it also frees you up from having to maintain your own time integration method. Um, so let's see how this works. Um, this is an example for what this looks like to, to set up uh, a multifab that, here we're going to set up a multifab to store some domain distributed data over MPI, we're going to loop over the grids in it and over our, our different levels in our AMR hierarchy. And, um, and we're just going to set the, the data at each level in each grid to zero. So this is how we do it. Um, we're going to write a function that takes 
a reference to a vector of multifab data structures. Each multifab then has pointers to local grid data for one MPI rank, uh, for rather for each MPI rank, and um, oops, and grid distribution metadata that enables communication. And so we're going to first loop over levels from course defined. So for int lev equals zero to num levels, um, or well, it's less, less than num level. Um, oops, I keep clicking. Um, first, we're going to grab our multifab, and then we have an OpenMP accelerated loop over our, our own uh, multifab iterator that loops over the grids local to each MPI rank within the multifab. Uh, we're going to grab our box, which has the 3, 3D index space for each grid or tile. We're going to grab an array 4, which is a lightweight struct that contains a pointer to the actual data and an access operator. And then we're going to write a pair, an AMREX parallel 4 function that will launch a GPU kernel. On the CPU, this simply is a, uh, a three-level nested loop. Um, and, and on the GPU, this will actually launch a GPU kernel as long as you include this AMREX GPU device um, macro. So you give it a C++ Lambda function that um, captures the array for um, by a copy with this uh, bracket equal sign. And then it takes an IJK integer that, um, that is, is essentially the innermost of our 3D nested loop in the parallel four. And this allows us to to access our local data using our spatial and component indexes. So we say array data, ijk, comma zero, gets our, our first component in, that is our, our first variable on the grid. And we just set it equal to one in this example. So this is an example of how to loop over levels, loop over grids in each multifab and set data. And this is essentially what we're going to take advantage of in AMRX codes to do everything. Um, so traditional, um, Traditional AMREX codes use subcycling. Um, this allows us this allows us to advance an AMR hierarchy by doing by taking time integration steps at each level, and then synchronizing between levels um, after they they reach equivalent times um, by doing fi find a course synchronization. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time walking through this. I just want to point out that one, this is a common design pattern in AMREX PDE solvers. Two. Um, you still have to write your own time integration scheme at each step here. And commonly we use for Euler or a Runge-Kutta method. Um, now we can use sundials in each step. And so um, this is simply pointing out that we can combine sundials with traditional design patterns in the AMRX codes. How does this work? We're going to walk through a heat equation example in the, just the next few slides. Um, first, we define a right-hand side and post-update functions. A right-hand side function in this case is, in this example, is a C++ Lambda function that takes a, a vector of multifabs for the right-hand side, a vector of multifabs for the data where we want to calculate the right-hand sides, and optionally a time argument. We're going to loop over boxes that specify our, our, our indexes. And we, we have our, an, the MF editor loop, just like you saw before. This, in this case, instead of setting the right-hand side to one, we're going to set the right hand side to um, we're going to set the right hand side to the right hand side for the heat equation using um, central differencing in each dimension. Um, so all we've written out here is phi right hand side array for a heat equation equals um, equals the heat equation uh, differential operator for uh, for the the heat variable phi, and you've seen our our spatial differencing here. We've got i plus one, i, i minus one in, in our second derivative. And we do the same in x, y, and z. And then um, this is our, our lambda function where we compute the right-hand side. Um, and then we specify a C++ lambda function for the post update. All we're doing here is um, this is a, a, a hook that we have in the integrator to let us fill boundaries between, for example, runge kutta stages where Every time we define some state data inside the integrator, we need to be able to, to do some kind of update that fills ghost cells um, to make that data valid. And so this takes a vector of multifabs and fills boundaries. In this case, um, we've got periodic boundary conditions. Um, 
So next steps. This is quite simple. We create a time integrator object. This is defined inside AMRX. It works with a vector of multifabs. We're going to call it integrator, and we're going to give it the old time state as an example of the data layout. Um, Next, we're going to say integrator.set right hand side. We're going to give it that right hand side lambda function that we defined. We're going to say, whoops, set post update. We're going to give it that post update function we just defined in the previous line. And then we're going to call integrator.advance to take us from the old state to the new state, which will be defined after this function. Um, and just like that, we're going to go from time to time plus dt. Now, this, this updates us from the old state to the new state. This looks sort of deceptively simple, and you might think this is too simple. Um, and that's sort of the all, of the, all of the cool features are buried inside this time integrator class. Um, and that's, so if you want to set, for example, what, what integrator you actually use to go from old to new state, then you'll, you're going to have to work with the inputs file for your application. Um, and that's what we're going to show next. So you got about a minute or two more, Don. Okay. Okay. That sounds great. So the, the next step is to specify what integrator backend you actually want to use at runtime. Um, this is an example here. We, we provide these input options. You can specify integration.type as sundials to use the sundials backend. Um, we also provide for Euler or Runcakata integrators that are written in, in native uh, AMREX uh, C++ that don't rely on the sundials backend, but integration.type equals sundials gets you, gets you sundials. Um, if you compile then with use sundials equals true, then you get to, then you get to use uh, the, the, uh, the sundials integrator options that are based on R code. Um, so for example, you can set integration.sundials.strategy equals ERK to use the explicit run to cut a stepper inside our code. And then, um, and then you can use integration.sundials.erk.method to tell it we want to use the SSPRK3, in this case, the, the third order strong stability preserving method. Um, and you see, we only have a few options that are currently implemented for the, the actual uh, ERK methods that you have access to. This is something that's very easy to, to add, but so far in, in our development, um, we, haven't, we haven't yet added all of the, the Sundial's butcher tables, um, but it's very easy. Uh, all we need to do is in, this, insert a few options. Uh, but basically this just translates the text you write in here to the actual butcher table that we request from Sundial's. Um, and then if you, that, so that's it for, that's it for your inputs file. And then you get to, to run with this inputs file. And this controls what integration strategy you actually use in this step to go from ultimate. So if you want any more information about this, then we provide a new chapter in our, um, in our AMREX documentation, where, which is labeled time integration. This describes all of the options that I've just described, as well as some sample code to set up, um, to set up a time integrator and, and step forwards. And this shows you how to set up the C++, C++ Lambda functions and, um, and the available options in the inference file. Um, so next steps here, um, if, you wanna, if you want to look at the tutorial code that I mentioned in more detail, you can go to, to this link where we have an AMREX tutorials repository and we've got a heat equation example based on AM, uh, AMREX plus sundials. Um, next steps will add more options for integrate, interfacing with CBODE. Currently, we just have interfaces with R code, um, as well as more, more choices for R code butcher tables and more choices for the Sundials nonlinear solvers that, that we have access to when using implicit options. Um, and so um, if you have any questions uh, or, want to, or want to let us know what you think, you can create a, an issue in AMRX here, or feel free to email us and get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Very nice walkthrough of that new interface in AMRX. I guess any any questions for Don? I think that's looking great, Don. It's nice to see there's a tutorial up, up now for that for people to follow through with. So thanks.
looking great. Absolutely. Well, uh, Thanks, David. Oh. Okay, well, uh, that's the end of the breakout session. Um, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, now would be a good time to ask them. Uh, otherwise, we'll, yes, Carol, go ahead. So this isn't for one of the speakers in particular, it's more for Elsa, I guess. Um, do you know <laughs> where the recording for the session will be uploaded once it's complete? Um, I'm not sure. I know they'll be made available. They, they're going to like double check for NDA and stuff like that. Okay. Well, I guess I'd like to say thank you to everyone and thank you to all, all of our speakers. It was a great set of talks. It was very it, it, interesting to hear about all, all of the work that's going on in the ECP with sundials. Um, I'm going to hang around here for a few minutes if anyone has any questions, but uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for one more time. We hope to see you uh, throughout the meeting.